So can everybody see from where they are? Yes. Okay. So um, I think most people know me, Ann Bauer. I chair the library trustees and have for quite a few years now. And um, we got this idea of having Cameron come to the library and talk about his work and his fascination, obsession with local history. And, um, and Cameron suggested that we make it in a conversation format. So I told him some of the questions I would ask, but others will undoubtedly pop up. And um, if you have a burning question, of course, you can chime in. Um, when you do do that, I will try and hear your question well and repeat it so that it goes to the recording and then Cameron can answer it, okay? Um, so before we start, let me just announce the upcoming events. Um, on February 11th is our Valentine's party, which starts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was scheduled for earlier and then Mother Nature interfered with some snow and ice. So that's the new date. Um, after that, the next event is our March 13th Winter Moth Storytelling Hour. A very popular program. We hope to have new people telling stories. We have a kind of core of folks who do that. And Mark Binder, our host, as we get closer to that time, will announce the theme. So, you know, that's how that goes. And you, you speak without notes. We will not record that, so you won't have to be nervous. Um, and you have five to eight minutes or so on to tell your true story that's related to that theme. On April 2nd, we're participating in the Vermont Reads program, and the book this year is The Hate You Give. And some of you might have seen the movie of this, which is already out. The movie's very good, and I suggest you watch it. Um, it's, a tough, it's a tough watch. It's a tough topic because it does deal with race and class and violence. Um, but it's a, an important topic, and the book which is written from the point of view of uh, a 16-year-old girl, has a lot of slang and some nasty language because that's the world she lives in. But I, I really hope you will get a copy of the book. We have about 25 copies, so you can check one out and keep it up until the time of the uh, discussion, and we'll let you know more about that when we get closer to that date. So, ready? I'm already, I have to just remember that um, I'm going to try to keep this a conversation, not a performance. Sometimes my ego gets Oh, a perform myself, away. So, yeah. We don't mind. <laughs> perform away. I never perform. Never. <laughs> okay. So, Cameron, um, just if you could just give us a tiny bit of background about yourself, where you were born, where you went to school, that kind of thing, and uh, then then we can get into my questions. Uh, okay. I was born here and never left. Okay. Uh, so anyways, <laughs> I, I was born in Hanover, New Hampshire and raised in West Hartford, Vermont. Okay. And I still live there. Uh -huh. yeah. So you grew your roots and you kept your roots. Uh, I guess you could say that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I didn't know any better to leave. <laughs> so what is it that first got you interested in history? Uh, honestly, neurosis is uh, the reason why. Could you explain a little about that? Well, I grew up uh, very insecure when I was a kid. Uh -huh. uh, my father and mother, they weren't really very well equipped to raise kids. Oh. And uh, my father, he, uh, he didn't like children. And my mother has a borderline personality disorder. Uh -huh. So a little so, difficulty there. Uh, I never knew that. I never knew that it was, I just thought it was all me. Oh, so, right. So right. I internalized it. And uh, so I described myself as being, uh, I was 16 until I was 32. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and then I kind of plateaued until uh, I met my current wife and uh, then I began acting my age. Oh, good. So, okay. Yes. Thank you, Evelyn. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, so, 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 anyways, um, 
being insecure, I think I created a lot of interior worlds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them were fairly fantastic. You know, uh, uh, I can remember, uh, you know, imagining uh, the combination of the landscape, spiritualism, ancestor worship, all this sort of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, that later evolved into an interest in uh, almost the reverse of genealogy. Instead of taking someone and researching back uh, through the generations, I would take someone in the past who was local 150, 200 years ago and then trace out their descendants. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was interested in kinship groups. So, uh, if, so if, you if, couldn't, if you couldn't have a good kinship group within your own family, you could create or imagine them in other people's families. Well, no, this, th by, this time, by this time, it was reality-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is when I was a teenager. Right. Yeah, when I, uh, when I was 13, I got interested in uh, family history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that uh, led to uh, a recognition that I was related to uh, a lot of people in the area. And so I was interested in, in how that was mm -hmm. and what it meant. So, so but, but, but um, what, I mean, did you have experiences in school around history or did oh, you know people well, well, who were well, interested in history? Uh, well, I, I never thought I could do anything right, uh, except I did well in history. Aha. So, um, I mean, I, my family didn't value education. Uh, my father was a self-made man with an eighth grade education plus one day of high school. So that's the, uh, that's the story that I sought to emulate. Yeah. But uh, um, history was always a passion for me, so I always did well in history. Uh -huh. uh, in, high, in high school, I mean, it was very lazy. I mean, uh, well, maybe I still am. I never do anything I don't want to do. So well, That's not lazy. That's just smart. Well, it, it doesn't pay sometimes, but anyway. You have a point. <laughs> anyway, um, so in high school, I remember one, I mean, I used, to, I used to get A's in history, and I remember one marking period, I got an A plus in history, and I failed English. And I remember going down the hall, and the English teacher come along, and he said, hey! And he grabs me, he says, what is this? What is this? He says, you get an A in my class, and you fail English. How is that? I don't like English. <laughs> How simple is that? Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, if someone had made the connections at the time that you know you use English uh -huh. in creating history, uh -huh. then uh, you know I probably would connect. But that was just so far out of my right. out of my realm at huh. that time. So um, it wasn't until uh, uh, I mean I, I, I read history books, and it wasn't until I uh, met a uh, Dartmouth professor, uh, Jerry Daniel who uh, uh, he kind of took me under his wing. So he encouraged your interest and showed you that you could develop it in some way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, throughout my life, I've had various books that are kind of like touchstones. Oh, tell me about that. Well, um, first one is uh, the children's Bible. My mother used to read the children's Bible to me. It was illustrated and the stories in there. Uh, Another one was Eric Sloan's Diary of an Early American Boy. Okay. And uh, that, that was one. Uh, the World Book Encyclopedia, we had that at my home. I read that. Um, I see a couple of people nodding. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, anyways, but it was the book, The Eastern Frontier, uh, which talks about colonial New Hampshire and Maine. And in, in there was a footnote. Mm -hmm. And it re referenced Jerry Daniel, and I had been to a talk that Jerry Daniel had given, right. and so uh, I was pretty excited to, that, to learn that he had written a book. So I called him up at Dartmouth, and he said, "Oh yes, yes, I wrote that book some time ago. Come on up, and you know if you want to uh, get one." So I did. He said, "We talked," and he said, "Well, he says, uh, uh, come on back if you know if you, if you ever have any questions." And uh, so um, I was at his house the other night. I haven't stopped Great. So since my 20s. So that's almost like a mentoring relationship that you had with him, would you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. sure it was. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until some time ago that I, uh, we, I rebelled, so to speak, <laughs> under his uh, mentorship. Uh, we, his wife laughs. She says, 
uh, the last few times to get there, there, it was in yelling matches. <laughs> it wasn't me being quiet. And well, no, listening. because you built up your confidence, right? And right. so now you had some opinions of your own to bring into well, the discussion. Well, I felt comfortable in challenging him with, right. my, with my opinions. Right. Say that. Right. So during this time when you were first getting interested in history and reading history and maybe thinking about doing something with these tracings yeah, of, yeah. of families into relationships, did you have a regular job? Did I have a regular job? I've never had a regular job. Did you have some kind of a job? <clears throat> uh, I've always had some kind of a job. Uh, I've done various things. Uh, <laughs> there was a joke uh, that at one time uh, I did itinerant pig butchering. I drove a uh, limousine. I did historical research and I played the bagpipes. And the joke was I should have one card and have them all on. <laughs> <laughs> That's on quite the, an assortment. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've worked in, I've worked at a, a grain store, a factory. Uh, one winter, I delivered tires in the, from a tire truck. Uh, so, you know, I, I do right now. I do uh, caregiving, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, part time, and that gives me uh, time to uh, right. pursue writing. Pursue yeah. your passion. Right. 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 So, so to you. It sounds like the research and writing is the vocation, and these other things are just what enable you to put food on the table and keep doing what you really love doing. Reading, writing, and visiting are central to my being. Mm -hmm. Those are central to me. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, trying to understand, get, gaining an understanding. Right. Uh, so where history comes in there is, uh, you know, I mean, I look around and I say, well, gee, why is this like this? And then uh, start doing research about it and, uh, and then, uh, then do the writing. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's move a little bit into that process. So if we could go back to your first book, which was the book about Joe Ranger, the first well, book? Uh, well, I'm going to go even uh, farther back than that. Okay. Um, um, I practiced writing with Jerry Daniel. Uh, I remember the first thing that I wrote, I never wrote anything in high school. And, well, you uh, said English was not your, your thing. Well, anyways, <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, to, one day I said to Jerry, I said, I'd like to write something and have you critique it on the level of me being a Dartmouth freshman. And this, I was in my mid twenties or so. Mm -hmm. He says, okay. So I did, and I wrote something about the origins of the Clifford family in New Hampshire. And uh, so he did. He read it, backed it up, and all of a sudden I get it back. I look, C minus. Oh. But underneath, not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry was an expert at that, uh, of that. Uh, Gives with one hand and, and, and takes and away then, with the And other. then being able to, yes, yes, yes. So after that, um, you know, I mean, I like doing that. And so I would write things. He would uh, critique them. Uh, I got involved with the Hartford Historical Society. And for a couple of years, I uh, wrote things for their newsletter. And then um, there's this publication, uh, the Dublin Seminar for New England Folk Life, which I used to, uh, I used to get. And uh, a friend of mine had written Kim Zay from Norwich. She mm -hmm. was a historian. And... Uh, she wrote an article uh, that was in one. And I read it and I said, you know what? I think I could do that. Uh -huh. So um, that, first, that first essay had to do with the North Pomfret subject. It, it was it, the theme that year. The, when it, the Dublin Seminar, uh, there's a three-day conference where people present papers. Mm -hmm. And then out of those papers, they choose a certain amount and they publish them in their annual proceedings. So... Um, I submitted a proposal which I accepted. It was called uh, Constant Strong's Diary, Women's Work in North Pomfret, 1890-1920. And the theme that year was Women's Work in New England, 1620-1920. Anyways, I, uh, I did a, uh, uh, a review of some of the diaries and letters around that period 
that she was getting married. So I highlight, <clears throat> what I did was I highlight the lives of some of these women and the, and the v variety of experiences that they had mm -hmm. within this small farm neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it was accepted. I gave the, uh, uh, the presentation and uh, afterwards uh, I, I talked about the sources. And part of it was, uh, you know, searching in, in old attics and, uh, 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 you know, places like that for letters and diaries and things. So in the audience was uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who was, she's now a Harvard professor. She wrote, uh, I don't know if anybody's read the, A Midwife's Tale. Oh, yes, I have read that. So um, she was right there and she made a beeline for me after I talked. And at the time she was doing, she was interested in um, New England antiquarians and collecting and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, in fact, she wrote, I think, out of that an article, I think it was called In the Attics and Rat Holes of Old Houses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she actually came up to my house with her daughter and uh, uh, visited me, and, and she was going to do a, uh, a video mm -hmm. uh, of... Um, uh, of different folks. It didn't go anywhere, but uh. anyways, um, so that was my first, my first, uh, uh, uh writing experience really to be, and being published. Right. So s since then I've, I've written, uh, for Dublin seminar and Vermont historical society and right. then the books. Right. So the articles came first. You, you sort of worked your way in through shorter projects before you undertook a longer project. Right, right. And then subsequently, I mean, I've also written other articles too, but sure. uh, so, yeah. So I have so many questions. Um, so one question is, you, I know because I visited you once at your house and read a bunch of diaries, I know that you have a huge collection of, of things that you've um, photocopied from, from people's materials and some original sources too. But how do you how do you figure out who has what that you want to see? Ah, uh, well, because that, I mean, how do you know that somebody has this trove, this treasure chest of of diaries or letters or things like that that are pertinent to right. some topic you're working on? Now you live in Pomfret. I still do. And uh, but you weren't born here. Correct. And you're not related to the people here. That is right. Okay. The answer is that I was born here and I'm related to everybody and I know, I know the business of, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I made it a point actually of being proactive mm -hmm. in seeking out uh, primary source material. So you mean you'd just be like at, at a turkey dinner with people and you'd say to the person sitting across from you, do you have some diaries? Oh, no, no, no. I'd go knocking on the door. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I... Um, uh, that's a little facetious, but I one one thing that I did is I do uh, I used to do uh, oral interviews, mm -hmm. taped oral, oral interviews. Oh, I have cool. a collection mm -hmm. about four hundred different tapes. So, anyways, mm -hmm. during the times that I would interview some of these elders and others, uh, they would tell me about family papers, mm -hmm. and so subsequently, you know, almost everybody lent them, you know, to me so that I could yeah. uh, uh, copy them, right. and uh, and as time went on I mean every collection made the whole more valuable sure. I mean it's it's you know <laughs> who cares about a little uh, you know 10 mile square area in the middle of Vermont but uh, there's uh, uh, you really can get a uh, pretty good um, view of life from the sources that remain In fact, that one article I wrote was it was called uh, uh, a neighborhood of diaries North Pomfret Vermont uh -huh. And one of the things was the extraordinary number of diaries that is still extant. Yeah. But uh, it's not, uh, what my contention is, is that it's not so much that all these people kept diaries. I think that was universal. But the odd thing is that they survived. Right. That their descendants kept right, them and right, valued them. Right. And right. that I looked them out, you know, and, mm -hmm. and searched them out. So, right. yeah. So, sort of a side question. So... This collection that you have, which is mostly photocopies of those original documents, uh, there's, there's, there's <coughs> a lot of different stuff there. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any plans for where that ends up, so that it's available to other people? I mean, we're in a library. I'm thinking about archives and research I've done in libraries. 
And you value these resources. The people who kept them valued them. What happens in the future? Well, uh, the last person that asked that to me was a member of a historical society and said, well, you know, we're wondering about, you know, your collection. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm very prepared to take over yours when, when you go defunct. <laughs> so, Not um, the answer they wanted to hear. That's right, that's right. So, um, um, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know yet what I'm going to do. I mean, I've talked to people at the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, I suppose, uh, you know, in time my daughter will have, uh, you know, a decision to make with it, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is she interested in history? Um, she doesn't know that she is uh, an excellent writer. Uh -huh. She's uh -huh. focusing on other things. Okay. Yeah. So it may grow. I don't know. Right, of course. We never do. We never do. Um, so let's talk about how you start, we'll say, a book for now. What is it that starts? What's the first okay. little spark well, that starts a book project? Okay. Well, I'll, let me just tell you about my first book. Okay. Okay. So um, my first book was... Uh, Failure, Filth, and Fame, Joe Ranger and the Creation of a Vermont Character. It's right over there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how that began, there was a couple things. Uh, growing up in the area, I had heard stories about Joe Ranger. He was, uh, he was this individual who uh, was born poor, lived poor, and died poor, all within a three-mile radius <laughs> of where uh, he was born on the Pomfret hartford border. No reason why anybody should pay attention to him, but he was an oddball. And uh, the thing is, late in life, he became one of the most photographed faces in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had heard stories all growing up. My, my father, different ones, talking about Joe. And, you know, how he was like a hermit and, and the odd things he would do. And he would talk with beaver. Well, one day... Did you say he talked with beavers? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm just checking. I, yeah, I, I wasn't I, sure I heard that right. I, I'm not, okay. I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> no, no. the, the topics no, or no. the conversation okay. they had. Okay. But, just checking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, one day I, I learned that, uh, some neighbors who re had recently moved into an old house, uh, had Joe Ranger's diaries. And I went up there and, and spoke with them and, uh, they were a little hesitant, and I, I uh, asked to borrow one diary, and I would transcribe it and get it back to them. So I did that within a matter of days, and that impressed them. And subsequently, they gave them all to me. So going through the diaries, and, and these are diaries from like the 19-teens, 20s, and then up into the 50s, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't see... A, a character or a hermit in there. What I saw was a guy struggling to farm. Uh huh. And so what I was interested in is, well, you know, you've had this dichotomy here. You know, it's, it's this guy farming and then this oddball who, who's a, you so know, two different character. pictures of the same Right, person. and so I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, reconcile those and see how... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So um, you talked about sources. I mean, Oral interviews was was one. Right. Uh, the diaries His diaries, themselves. absolutely diaries. Diaries of neighbors. Uh -huh. There was a well, you know, I mean, his uh, two of his closest neighbors kept diaries, you know, for much of mm. their lives. Mm. So uh, there was that. Uh, newspaper articles. Uh, there even was a, a, a USDA uh, script of a of a film that the USDA did. And uh, Joe appeared in that. Huh. That was it. Was during the era of uh, they were trying to improve agriculture, but Joe appeared as what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> so oral interviews and the diaries themselves. So I'm picturing you um, interviewing people and reading all of these diaries and when you read the diaries let's say are you like making little notes to yourself or just in here well i'm very inefficient and uh i mean i know there are you know historians and people who well they know what they're gonna 
what they want to look for and uh, mm -hmm. but um, I kind of uh, I'm kind of uh, I don't go with a preconceived you're kind open. of notion you're open. You know, I want to because a because a lot of the best things are what you're not looking for that you come across always right so um, I, I read everything mm -hmm. I go through everything and that takes a long time and I read and then I'll read again and take notes uh, and I compile mountains of material you know and I'll have a pile of stuff like that that, that, must be that fun ends to up live with. ends uh -huh. up like that yeah so mm -hmm. so so it's kind of um, like swimming around in a big pond and looking well, to see what's well, there well, and accumulating it yes it is putting it, a few things in the boat and rowing those to shore and getting a few more things and seeing how they relate to each other well sinking and get another boat <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, really. I mean, there's. Oh, sh sure. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I have all this stuff, and then I, I try to write something, which always sucks. Of course. You know, I mean, it's it's a the, good the, first draft is supposed to be a mess. Well, the first six are. Yes. You know. Okay. So um, no, but seriously, I mean, I I writing isn't easy. No. It I've. <laughs> Historical writing, I've heard uh, Bernard Balin, you know, preeminent uh, early American historian, said that historical uh, writing is uh, sometimes an art, always a craft, and never a science. Uh -huh. And so I, you know, I uh, remember that. Um, so the writing is, you know, just trying out different ideas and, right. and, and not worrying so much about the flow necessarily. So I'm picturing you have, are you writing on a typewriter by hand, on a computer? Yes. All? Yes. All of these things? Yeah. Uh, the typewriter, no, but... but um, Get rid of the typewriter. Yeah. So, so we I have do the yellow tablet with the notes and writing right. and right. trying out ideas and a laptop or a computer of some kind. And I, also, and I also have a small uh, word processor that's not a laptop because the only thing it does is word process. Right. It never crashes. Very so, good. Yeah. It's not strained. So, so you get paragraphs and passages and descriptions and theories, and you, you get a bunch of these, and then does it sort of just emerge how you will organize that material into a book? Never. So Never. how do you get there? Blood, sweat, and tears. It's it's it really it's 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 a struggle. But the thing is, you know, life is a struggle and it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And uh, years ago, I had two main focuses in my life. And that was raising my daughter and producing history. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, you, my, those are the two most important things. I wasn't going to fail at either one of them. No. So uh, it's just tenacity, and uh, and I I enjoy it. It's great fun. That's that's a fabulous attitude. Yeah, no, I mean it's you know to 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 uh, look at something, figure out what's going on, and then make sense of it and say, hey, this is what I found out. Right. You know. It is a real process. Right. Of right. So so yeah. it it typically to do a book it takes five years for me. So I can imagine it would, to do yeah. the the research, but and you're not writing on a deadline. You're not saying to some. It's too important yeah. to have a deadline. I mean, it's 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 central to my being, and I've got all my life to do this. Uh -huh. So, right. um, I. The first book I wrote, a lot of it I wrote at my house, and some of it I wrote, in the mornings while my daughter was taking a shower, and I was using her computer. So some of that, but subsequently, most of the writing that I do is out in public. Really? Yeah, I like I like the buzz of people around. Uh huh. So in a cafe or a yep, yep. library so, or well, yeah, more more uh, uh, where people are around. So uh, the the I guess I said with my second book I wrote uh, down in West Lebanon at a, uh, a cafe down there, hmm. and my days that I spent there, the time that I spent there was either reading, writing, or visiting in various combinations. Some days, I sat there two months without writing a word once. 
I was depressed and I, I couldn't get anything out. Yeah. But uh, typically every day, you know, something would get written. But you showed up at the office. <laughs> Always, yes. I, uh, I, I joke, there was one year I ate lunch there every single day. Mm -hmm. And uh, last fall they took away the, my cozy chair. So after 15 years, I left them. And uh, show them. well, I figure I spent twenty thousand dollars there Whoa. in that time. That's expensive. So, right? that's so uh, it's not so bad over a period of fifteen years when I think about it. That's not so bad. Three dollars a day. Really? Okay. So um, subsequently, I uh, I found another place, not mm -hmm. quite so cozy, but still functional. Yeah. So I think I think sometimes people find that a space like that with that buzz around you, it kind of forces you to focus kind of against it and allows the concentration oh, for well, some people it, to be better. Well, it depends on what's being discussed right next to me. I mean, I... Oh, you don't I, need I, to eavesdrop, do you? Oh my gosh, I, I was sat at a place where there were so many hookups at this one table there, there was discussions <laughs> about people getting together. So, uh, but serious, seriously, uh, 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 I did get in a lot of conversation, met a lot of, meet a lot of nice people. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, and, and that kind of a setting, you get into conversation, oh, yeah. you know, like that. Right, right. I mean, my, met my, I met my wife there. Cool. And uh, at, at the time, I, uh, I, I, well, I was at Ben Sigel for a while, and uh, my daughter uh, said, Dad, you sit there, and you're looking all around, you know, like you're, you're, you're and I said, well, Mackenzie, I'm waiting for the right one to come. She said, Dad, you freak women out. <laughs> you stare. She said, you act like you want to eat them. <laughs> so uh, anyways, I, uh, um, uh, uh, but I got in conversation with many people. Yeah. And so uh, visiting and reading, I mean, writing and reading go together. Right. You know. So, okay. So you have this interesting process. And you get to a stage where you think you have the book written. Now what happens? Um, so when you say that, it, when yes, okay, I've got it set where I think I, I have people read it all. It's, it's draft one, two. Three. Sure, sure. And I have I have different people like Jerry Daniel will, will read. Uh, I have a guy who's the editor of the manuscripts of the Vermont Historical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, he reads, he usually reads them for me. Uh, I've had uh, schoolgirls that uh, were in my, my, uh, uh, son, my stepson's class, uh, one that's, she's an excellent writer and she read and gave me uh, critique. Mm -hmm. So um, various, various people. And um, once I get it set, then um, it goes on to the production, and but also the gathering of. I, I also have to hire someone. I hire someone to do the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy who's at Dartmouth who does maps there. Mm -hmm. um, I I absolutely rely on uh, copy editing. I mean, I'd look like a fool if I didn't. And so I don't remember if your books have indexes or not. Uh, indexes and annotations. They're all uh, no. Yeah. So you have help. With that, you don't do the indexing yourself, do you? Oh yes, I do the. Oh, I do. I, I have do it done that. Trust me, people. Indexing a book is a painful, painful, tedious process. Oh my God! You poor thing. Well, you did. <laughs> no, it was fun. You're a very strange person. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I revel in that. <laughs> no, it, it, took, it, took, it took me a month to do uh, the last uh, index that I, I did. Oh, I believe it. I believe yeah. it. It's, but I mean, it's, it's necessary. It's interesting in a way, yeah. and, and figuring out the process you're going to use for yourself, given you know how much you want to do by hand and how much you can do on the computer and how detailed an index you want to have, all of that. It's an interesting sorting, problem-solving kind of activity. Mm -hmm. And I guess after you've been working for five years on a project, it's a different kind of activity and almost perhaps a relief to have something a little bit more mechanical to do rather than so generative, you know. You're well, pulling on different parts of yourself. Right, right, right. Uh, for me, it's, it's the last thing that has to be done right. because you have to get 
the, the text, everything is set. Right. So after it's designed, then the last thing that happens is that index. Right. And uh, so it's kind of like the crowning part. And, you know, there's a certain amount of excitement wanting to get this done. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and some, I mean, I don't use a computer for the indexing. I do it all. I, what, what my process is, is I, I print out the, the uh, um, manuscript and then with a highlighter, I highlight uh, topics and uh, uh, not to um, uh, uh, places and people. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have another highlighter for and I'll make ideas. And uh, then I go through and and, and so uh, then you that. have separate cards or pages and you start reading through and putting right yeah. right yeah. So with your books, have you mostly self-published? Only self-published. The first one, um, uh, the Vermont Historical Society, their uh, publication committee considered uh, uh, the possibility of, of publishing it, mm -hmm. but they uh, ultimately passed on that. And uh, so I, I remember, uh, uh, I actually hired, you know, hired a guy to do the copy editing. Uh, there was a guy that uh, did the designing, and I found a printer in New York to, mm -hmm. to uh, print it. Right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, email those things to, to them, and then uh, they, you, 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 you pay, pay the money, money, pay the money, <laughs> right. and, and they'll ship you books. And how many, um, with the Joe Ranger, how many, how many copies did you order first? Oh, well, this is interesting, this thing about... <laughs> I'm, I'm interested but, in all the aspects. Yeah, of yeah, it. yeah. Well, uh, the the business of self publishing is not getting any easier. It, no? it, it's very. It's <laughs> Samuel Johnson said that only a blockhead would write without getting paid, and I don't know what the hell he would say for me paying in order to write. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the first book I did, the Joe Ranger book, I uh, actually. Uh, sold about 1,200 copies of that uh -huh. and it was a perfect storm because uh, we had uh, a Borders down in West Lebanon, New Hampshire <coughs> and they had a local table which was right next to the checkout. Ooh, so right. Joe Ranger, the, the cover, I mean there's this oddball on, on the cover so he was there looking people right in the eyes they came up and they and, and so it got attention that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, newspaper coverage plus he was uh, it was a subject that was already you know well known right. so that one borders in a six-month period sold 324 copies mm -hmm. they'd never seen anything like that yeah. happen before for a self-published book yeah yes that's right yeah. right so um, that worked out pretty well so the second one I said well okay I did an initial printing of a couple hundred and uh, got rid of most of those and then I got 500 and I think I got 450 still mm -hmm. so uh, I, the, the, the second one uh, borders had closed mm -hmm. so that I had to uh, sell on my own right so to speak right. and uh, and did uh, sold some mm -hmm. this current book now um, I don't care if I sell any I've, what a I've wonderful attitude I, mm -hmm. I printed uh, I printed uh, 100 copies and my what my goal my goal is leaving a wake behind me i guess you could say uh -huh. and so if these things are in existence an example is this i can remember being a kid and reading you know an account of uh, uh, uh settling of pomfret and i can remember just being mesmerized by the way that this person uh, described it and I thought, gee, you know what? If in the future, if anybody reads anything that I do and they have an appreciation like I did, that that's worth it. That's your legacy. That, that that's that's kind of worth it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's not. It's definitely not the money, you, you right. know. Uh, it's it's uh, it's meaning, you know, in life. Make, you know, right. making uh, leaving something behind. Well, making meaning, I think, for most of us, is very important. Important. However, we do it in terms of, you know, raising a family or sustaining a farm, um, working on issues that we care about, working with organizations, and we all have different ways of doing that. And I find what you're doing really quite fascinating. Um, 
and that you can sustain it for yourself? Well, I've organized my life around being able to do that. Right. So, but again, part of that had to do with, uh, uh, as I say, the neurosis too. So. <laughs> well, I think there are neuroses and obsessions we could call useful and some that are destructive. And well, you've made good use of yours. Well, you know? but in the end, uh, uh, okay, I've accomplished this, but maybe I would have been a lot happier if I hadn't had to go through all that. Well, yeah. Maybe so we, that's the thing, we, you know, an artist, you have an artist who creates, you know, but is it better that they create or that maybe they live a happy life? Good question. Good question. So it sounds like from what you've said so far, the things that encourage you are people who you respect or whose opinions you value, giving you some feedback and your own innate sense of what matters. Are there things that discourage you when you're involved in one of these projects? Things that discourage me? Well, um, this current book is the first book that I've produced that uh, I never got depressed. So... Uh, um, That's a step. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas in the past, I mean, I would... My, my life has been uh, uh, years ago somewhat manic. I mm -hmm. would be way way up and you know with all these ideas that were impractical and uh and then i'd go crash way down and mm -hmm. be down and wouldn't be able to do anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so when people say that you know uh they they uh, uh they fear taking medication because it may create their it may uh, uh, inhibit their creativity yeah. i found that just bunk it opened up for me and made ah, me being able, being able to function. That's good to hear. That's yeah. good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so any discouragement that you have felt in the past. I people see... don't discourage me. Yeah. Yeah. Good for no, you. No, no. Yeah. Pe people don't discourage me. Um, and time doesn't either, because as I said, uh, you know, I don't have any set, you know, goal. I mean, I know I'm going to finish it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing that's going to stop me. Wow. And so it, 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 there's, there's, uh, it's just time. Yeah. And I've got the rest of my life. So it's so interesting because, you know, when you started out talking, you were presenting us with this idea of somebody who was insecure and didn't have self-confidence. But you clearly have developed a deep sense of self-confidence in regards to oh, this I'm... aspect of your life. Well, everything, because I know who I am now. Yeah. It, you know, it wow. took, uh, it took a long time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so um, let's also return to this topic of the things you've read. So hmm. you, mm -hmm. you mentioned a few books that you read okay. when you were younger. Yeah. And I'm wondering now. What am I interested in? What, what I... things are influencing you or do you find intriguing? Not, not only directly feeding into your projects, but in yes, general yes, yes. Into, into history. Yeah. Well, I read, I read almost exclusively nonfiction. Mm -hmm. The only fiction I read is uh, every uh, November when the uh, best series comes out, I always read Best American Short Stories. Mm, that's a good and, one. And yeah. uh, so that, that's, that's the only uh, uh, fiction that I read. Uh -huh. But uh, my interest, you know, I mean, I, I'm interested in biblical scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, Michael Satlow, he's from Brown. Uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, he's a biblical scholar down at uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, John Dominic Crossan, he wrote uh, The Historical Jesus. There, so biblical uh, scholarship is an interest of mine. Uh, also medieval, uh, medieval Europe. So uh, there is a group of micro, they call micro historians. Uh, one is uh, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, who wrote Montaigu. Mm -hmm. uh, Natalie Zeman Davis, she wrote The Return of Martin Guerre. Um, and Carlo Ginsberg wrote uh, The Cheese and the Worms. So oh, th that one I've heard of. <laughs> yep, yep. So those, those, are, those mm -hmm. are, you know, seminal books. That um, I'm interested in the history of the book. Mm. So, uh, you know, book production and book use. Uh, one, one book I really enjoyed was William Sherman's uh, book on marginalia. 
So uh -huh. it's people who read and they talk back to their books, they're writing right. in there. Right. And uh, so there's that uh, early, and then, you know, early American historians, <laughs> uh, Laurel Thatcher, Ulrich, uh, Jill Lepore, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Taylor is my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, uh, he's number one in my, uh, my list as far as my favorite historians yeah. that, that I read. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Well, you've told us an awful lot and there may be questions that other people in the room have. And so I want to give you a moment to think about your questions and we can have Cameron respond to those. What's next? What's next? What's next? Well, what's next? you mean what's going on now? What's because when you say book, next, what's look, next okay, okay, well, what, let, what, let me say what, this. What's next book that you are looking yeah. for? So, uh, my last book that I did, I uh, met with the designer for the final, final go over of the index and everything on a Sunday. And we sent it off to the printer and on Monday I started my new book. So I don't let in, in between. <laughs> so uh, what I'm writing about now is I'm interested in the village that I live in, in West Hartford. And I'm interested in the different kinds of villages that it's been hmm. over time. But also, also, I'm consider I have a friend who, uh, she wrote a memoir and, um, uh, in Japan, and uh, she encourages me to put myself in this book, too. Ooh, that'd be a new step. So, it, it would. So, I'm considering how I might do that, and how I might will be uh, possibly discussing about the sources in my interaction with the sources in creating mm. this history. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure exactly how that's going right. to come about. But, but um, so uh, about West Hartford. But in a, a new style, perhaps, getting yourself into the book, book a little bit. I, Maybe. I, I, I suppose new. I mean, I'm... Well, you, you haven't know, done I, that I, in the other books. No, no. No. All right. So, Corey, you had a question back there? Yeah, just a clarification that family that moved into the house that had they had the diaries of Joe Ranger yes were they were the diaries just in the house that they moved into or were they actually related or friends with Joe Ranger to how did they how did they acquire the diaries? okay wait so before we have the answer I'm just gonna sort of repeat it a little bit for the camera so this is a question about the folks who had the diaries that Cameron used when he wrote the Joe Ranger book or started the Joe Ranger book and if the family that he who, who had those were related to Joe Ranger or if they just found the books in the house by luck well I'm going to try to make it simple here um, the uh, the house had been occupied by an old guy who was a contemporary of Joe a, a younger but uh, uh, but a friend of his and used to uh, take care, help take care of him, look after and things. So um, when Joe died, uh, he took Joe's diaries out of the house and kept them at his place. This place where he lived, he did not own. He was the caretaker of. Mm -hmm. So the family uh, uh, lived down in Massachusetts and a younger generation decided to move up there in part of the house. So um, subsequently, the, old, the older fellow moved out and uh, the family were there by themselves. But uh, they, so they ultimately came across them in the house. But you said but that he had moved them out of the house. He had moved them out of Joe Ranger's house to his, his house. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you, you touch on something, you know, as far as like the, the, the sources, I mean, <laughs> I'm sometimes like a vulture waiting. Uh, when when someone dies, uh, I know there's two individuals down my way in West Hartford that, uh, well, the first one, I waited, um, and his brother came and was going to clean up, and I went by, and there was a fire, and I pulled right in there, and I said, Everett, Everett, you know, have, have you found any stuff like this? And he's, oh, I'm oh, I'm glad you weren't here just a while ago, and he wouldn't tell me what he had burned, but. Aww. He did pull out some boxes of things, oh, nice. so there were so he pulled out uh, uh, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, and another another time uh, a neighbor died, and uh, I kept an eye on the place. And one day I saw a pickup backed up to the barn and up top, and 
they were throwing stuff in and I'd see papers. <laughs> so I stopped and I said, geez, if you've seen any papers, just put them in a box here. And uh, that was a very, uh, very rich and personal trove, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of interesting things in that collection. Uh -huh. So anyway, so that's part of how I, I, I get things too. <laughs> I haven't broke into any place yet. But. So if you, you know, if you have some boxes of things in your attic and you want uh, the vulture to come and no, check them out. No, I, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, 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 I say I'm done. I, uh, uh, I stopped collecting. Oh. So um, although very recently uh, a neighbor of mine passed away and... Uh, I, I, I get the papers out of that yeah. house, so, yeah. Other, other, two other questions. So, Joanna? You haven't said a lot about the actual content of the books, of which I gather there are three, and the titles run to initial Fs, Failure, Filth, okay. Fame, Farms, Fords. Um, I read... The Farms, Flatlanders, and Fords, yeah. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I don't know why they didn't all sell out in Pomfret with people who wanted to know the history. Oh, that's very nice. And yeah. I would love to have the new book, and it's said in the standard or somewhere that I could only get it on Amazon, and I don't use Amazon. And but you were I'm here in the library desperate. where we have copies for sale. And well, so I, what I will. want to do is have a copy of that, not via Amazon. Well, you you are in the right place at the right time. All right. And yeah, I don't want to. I don't deal but with selling things on Amazon. I don't want. I, I don't have a cell phone. I don't do email myself and or social media, but I make use of things as I as I can. So I I have a, a guy who uh, uh, sells the uh, the books on Amazon for me. And huh. he, he, you know, gets money for, right. for doing that. Right. So, so you, you said that, that the topics. So yeah. Joe Ranger was about, uh, uh, you know, this, this right. character and, and how Vermont changed. Not necessarily that he did, but that Vermont changed. Right. Uh, Farms, Flatlanders, and Fords is how uh, uh, a rural Vermont neighborhood uh, transformed the 20th century through agricultural decline, gentrification, and automobility. Those three things and came now together. Now I'm going to interpolate because if you haven't read this book, it's about, well, North Pomfret more than South Pomfret, but it is about the change in, in the economy of North Pomfret with lots of names named. And if you've been here a long time, you know those people and you remember those people. And he's got genealogies and it's absolutely fascinating. And if you don't know those people, it's still very interesting because it takes you through the same series of changes that were happening in other places in the country too, right? They just affected each little locality in specific ways. But it is, it is a broad general history also that, you know, introduces you to different concepts of how different economic things affect people in their lives. It's what, it's, it's what happened locally uh, within a broad context. Right. Yeah. Right. So my my newest book is called uh, Town Founders. Um, government officials, entrepreneurs, and settlers in early New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, 1720 to 1810, and that's how uh, how Northern New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, particularly not Maine, uh, how property was created how land went from being uh, native land, how it was appropriated, uh, granted to groups of individuals who were investors, uh, and then uh, into the hands of settlers and how they established town government. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the, and that's, you know, that happened throughout America. Right. You know, how that, but it, within New England had its particular way. Right. So it's a macrocosmic topic, but looked at through a microcosmic well, there's focus. A yeah, there's a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, detail. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say right off the bat that uh, first third is tedious. It's well, pretty tedious. You've because been warned. You, you, have, you, have to, you have to, but, but you have to get through this stuff. Yeah. 
in order to get a proper understanding of what subsequently comes. Right, right. So uh, by uh, chapter two, uh, I say, oh, well, okay, all right, I, can, I guess I Things can. Things begin to pick and up. And then hopefully by the third chapter, I think, uh, you know, you'll say, well, this was worthwhile. Good, good. Yeah. Chuck, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Um, listening to you uh, describe your process, and then talking about the, the next book and the fact that you don't care whether anybody buys it made me think that you almost don't care whether you actually publish it because it's the process that's the most important thing, the well, work that's the most important thing. But then I realized that you do care whether or not it's published because you want it to be there. You want it to be part of your legacy and part of the record. Exactly. Exactly. So, if if it appears in bibliographies or, or on uh, you know the internet, saw so world cat world catalog of books, uh, or in uh, uh, you know libraries, uh, that's that's. I mean, how many I sell, I don't care. But if it's out there so that people have access to it and, and read it, read them, uh, you know, and it's available for the future. Sure, I uh, I did a little uh, uh, epithet. Epi, uh, epitaph for myself, and it goes, um, it goes, um, sorry, now I lost it, but um, what I have written can still be read after what you said has been long forgotten. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I'll really have that on or not, but, um, so uh, that, but yes, so, but, but the, but the process, you know, that's, the process is life. It's you know going through life and, and creating and making sense of uh, things and uh, yeah figuring out. I have just one more question for you, if nobody else does. So, do you ever have to go outside your local sources to fill in some of the background, like you know to understand about the manufacturing of Fords, let's say? Do you mm -hmm. have to? Go and do research that's beyond your local stuff. Oh, always. Yeah. Always. And where do you do that? Oh, uh, we have uh, Baker Library, Dartmouth College, right in that mm -hmm. backyard. Yeah. You know, so you can get that. You can go there. I mean, I right. you know do research there when I need mm -hmm. uh, online. Yeah. In fact, that <laughs> I don't know how much time, but that, just a little story here. Uh, the second book that I wrote, I spent. Uh, how many hours at the Woodstock Historical Society going, I went through 80 years of newspapers, every single issue, looking for the Vermont, for the Vermont Standard North Pomfret Correspondent, 80 years. And every session I'd be there for a few hours and I might do a year or two. Uh -huh. So I spent some time there. I guess. So with the current book, um, I was going to have to repeat part of that because I was going to do the same for West Hartford. I went there and uh, was helped by Jenny Shirtliff there, and she said, well, I, I asked her if, instead of writing down, if I could borrow her iPad and take photographs of these things. And she said? And she said, by all means, uh -huh. and I did. But before I finished, uh, the director said, something grand has happened. Newspapers.com now has the Vermont Standard complete, and you so can search it. So there's a whole archive, you in searchable. Yeah. So what I've done is I I paid twenty dollars for a month and sit sit home and can uh, search the, the the newspaper and not just one newspaper. You can multiple newspapers. Wow. With you know, and you can limit it or expand it yeah. for uh, whatever subject you want. Right. Uh, and. Uh, it, it really has... Uh, it's a revolution in yeah, it has, researchers, it, has. it really right. is. So yeah. the point being is yes, there's there's lots of other okay. material that okay. you know, makes okay. use of. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time, but I really appreciate your openness and willingness to talk about things and to tell us a few stories and explain your process and your dedication. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and thank you very much. You're welcome. In the other room, we have copies of Cameron's books. He very kindly is giving the profits from those sales to the library, and we also have snacks.
So we'll all move into there, and you can ask additional questions of or make comments to Cameron. And um, so that will be the, the final part of our afternoon together. Thank you. Okay. Where do you work?